trying very, very hard to not be irritated with Xfinity right now. And we'll see. Looks like it's white. Uh, it's got the white light on now, which is what I'm looking for. So hopefully it doesn't hiccup again. Otherwise, I'll have to figure something out. But, okay, we're going to give this a shot. So I did do a little bit of poking around. The internet came up and down a couple more times, and it's been here for about 30 minutes. So while it was up, I went ahead and got my shop set up and got into the admin panel and everything here. So we should be good to go. And there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of interesting stuff here too. So it looks like the way that this is set up, um, and if you, if you were watching the last stream uh, where it cut off because my internet connection, um, we got to the point where we were setting up the shop. It's very, very simple. You just title it whatever you want. It'll create a subdomain for you here, exactly as we were talking about. So you see the arson.myshopify, this is my shop. Uh, and then it'll redirect you over to an admin panel here where you can start to go ahead and get everything set up. So that's the only thing that I did, just started poking around a little bit. Um, I think, so the shop itself is obviously going to be an interesting point to test. I do want to play around with the, not the admin panel here, but the, the previous section to where you can actually uh, get those set up to where you can actually create the stores because it looks like you may have some, some fun functionality there. But what's really standing out to me right now is this, this admin panel. And the reason for that is the URL up here. So I got redirected over here from the, when, when I set everything up, and it's under the admin.shopify, so this is all gonna be one static application, and then we have the store endpoint, and then under that we have an arson endpoint, which this is gotta be a path parameter that's going to be associated with um, the store that, that you're gonna king. Hey, Infinity, thank you for coming back. Yeah, it, it looks like it's good now. Um, hopefully it'll stay that way. Um, yeah, 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 I don't know. Xfinity, I, normally they're, Pretty good, especially where I'm at in Houston. Um, but something, something must have happened today. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, I was just saying. We, so we got our store set up now. It's very, very easy. You just go in there and uh, uh, add whatever you want to call it. We've got our admin panel, and then we've got uh, our actual store over here. Um, so anyway, like I was saying, this is really interesting to me. This is a path parameter for your store. So that means that these admin panels are all contained under the same application. They're all under the same domain. So there's a lot of opportunity here. You know, it, the simplest thing to test would be, um, you know, if, if Infinity had, had a store as well, you know, and, and it titled it for a name there. So Infinity TTY right there. Um, you know, this would be an example of an IDOR potentially. Now, obviously, um, you know, we don't have a store set up like that, and that's going to be a very, very simple test. But that illustrates why I think this is interesting. Um, potentially, and especially with this being an admin panel, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that they don't have this built in to the store itself where you have a separate subdomain. This is almost definitely going to be an entirely separate standalone instance of the application. So uh, surprised that they did it that way. Um, and I would love to know, just like that would be an IDOR to, to uh, interact with um, the other instance, the admin panel with, with the path parameter, can I get other IDORs to affect other uh, uh, objects that are in the database that don't belong to me? Can I, can I read maybe, uh, I mean, something that may be really simple is an online store here. All the online stores have a, a password. Um, it's not for the admin panel, it's just to get into the store. So if you only want certain people to be able to get in, uh, where was it? Was it under preferences, I think? I just found it. Yeah, yeah, so you can just set a simple plain text password and then when somebody wants to, to go to your store, uh, looks like I've got a session there, but let's do a, a new private window here. You can see that it just asks you for a password and I can type my, um, you know, that's just RS0 in and it'll allow me to get it. So not a, a you know, major secure password to allow people to come to the, uh, the, the store itself, but if you don't want it, certain people to come in there and I can exfiltrate that, that may be decent. It's not going to get us our 200K, but you know, we're starting to put the picture together. We're starting to look at what we potentially can play with, what objects are in the database, what, uh, you know, what is the architecture of it. These are all things that are going through my head as I'm starting to get the lay of the land, starting to figure out what mechanisms I really want to dig into. I want to start fuzzing. I want to start trying to find uh, an exploit that I can get. 
let's close out of that there and come back to our actual store here. Discord. Um, yeah, what, what about it? To, to post some stuff there? I can definitely, I mean, we do have a Discord going that, uh, I don't know if anybody's going to jump in the voice chat, but we can certainly, uh, certainly drop those in there. Uh, okay, so let's come and do the same thing we did the last time. Let's look in the developer tools. Let's see if there are any uh, glaring mistakes. So things like this. Um, it's immediately calling out the same site lacks setting on a lot of the cookies that are in here. Um, oh yeah, yeah, so we have, uh, I don't have my own Discord server. Uh, we have a uh, Discord server for our, um, for our company, for our, our team. So uh, the company that work out there. Um, but we have other people that aren't in the company that are there. So if anybody wants to join, you certainly can. And we share, we do group bug bounty sessions in there and, and uh, stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think here in the near future, I'm going to get my own. It probably makes sense. And yeah, that's where, you know, it'd be uh, uh, the exact same thing that we're doing there. Be able to share everything out and um, facilitate like group hacking sessions, things like that. Um, Oh, and I'm seeing in my Discord too. So uh, some of the uh, members of my team who are a little more familiar with Twitch are now explaining to me what, uh, what you were talking about, Infinity. Um, yeah, <laughs> it says, uh, all that links to Discord. Oh, I see. Oh, cool. I can get that set up. I can get that set up. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm still trying to figure all this stuff out. Um, but we can do that. Hold on. Let me, let me see if I can get you a link. You can get in here. How do we do that? There you go. I'll just drop it right here in the chat. Anybody that wants to join is more than welcome to join. Thanks, Owen. <laughs> Owen is a, a member of our team that he actually told me yesterday uh, it had originally thought about doing uh, YouTube and, and Twitch and everything uh, professionally as a career before he uh, joined the team at, at Flowcast. So um, he actually was... was uh, using uh, his time to educate me on a lot of that stuff, which was incredibly valuable and is, is continuing to do that. Uh, so thank you very much, Owen. Okay, cool. All right, I'm figuring stuff out. I'm figuring stuff out. I'm a little old, I apologize. It's gonna take be a little bit of a learning curve for guys my age, but, but I'm gonna figure it out. Um, but, so same site strict. If anybody's not familiar with this cookie, the same site strict cookie, uh, it will, uh, it's designed to prevent uh, CSERF attacks. So it will control where a request can come from. So uh, I always call this out, but when there was a, I think this was two years ago, that there was a uh, paradigm shift to where uh, browsers made this mandatory in some way. Uh, and I saw a lot of developers becoming a lot less concerned about CSERF and uh, there was a lot of opportunity for what's called a session writing attack, which is chaining a cross-site scripting in a CSER. So when I see things like this, where it's calling out, we've got same site lacks, I'm thinking about the same things. I'm thinking about, um, again, and, and with this admin panel, I want to be able to try to, try to uh, execute some type of function or exfiltrate data from my target, uh, from somebody else's admin panel. You know, can I exfiltrate data? Can I make them uh, do something that they didn't intend to do? And that is the exact goal of that session routing attack. So I'm, I'm immediately taking note of this, that, well, if they have some misconfigurations in the same site strict cookie, and I can find a cross-site scripting, so if, I, if this is a JavaScript heavy on the client side, maybe prototype solution two, cross-site scripting, et cetera, then I can potentially force that admin to say, change the password of their store without their, them meaning to. It doesn't look like there's a lot of protection on that. Um, and you could even expand that a lot more. So. Um, I know we're looking for the for big ones. We're trying to get to those mechanisms. Could have those 200k. That's something that you could end up getting. That if you could possibly completely take over somebody's Shopify account through that, then it's certainly uh, certainly a possibility for getting a major payout. So this is interesting to me. Um, let's go in and look at what the cookies are. Let's see how much parity there is between this and the uh, platform that we were looking at before. Uh, so you have a lot of the same tracking cookies, which is not surprising. Um, they're probably going to be across all of their different sites. Uh, we've got some dates, basic IDs. Where's our session token? That wouldn't be 
see it right there. I see some data that's stored in here too. Um, as I'm looking through these cookies, I'm not just looking at what the cookies are, looking at their flags, what they're doing. I'm also looking at seeing if they have any data stored. That can be an attack vector. So if they have data stored in them, and this certainly uh, looks like it has, is that JSON data? Yeah, it looks like it's uh, some JSON data. Um, you know, and here in a bit, I would take this out and decode it, and I'm looking for a signature here at the end. I don't see a signature. That means that there's no mechanism in place right now to verify the integrity of this. And what I mean by that is what the, what the developers could do is they could uh, add a uh, hash or digital signature to the end of it that was generated in combination with that data and the secret key on the, the back end that they have, that me as the attacker, I don't have. And that way, if I change any of the data, they're gonna validate that signature before they process any of the data. So it prevents the data in the cookies from becoming an attack vector that somebody like me can target. They don't have this on here. So that's a com that combination is something that I'm always taking notice of because they have data in the cookies, then it's definitely processing and using that data at some point. The question is, is how it's processing it, that, that mechanism, is that valuable enough to me? Is it getting me close enough to the database or the server itself to where I can possibly get a high impact vulnerability? I don't know that yet, but the fact that I see that this has data, it is not signed, so there's no way to validate the integrity, and there's no uh, HTTP only flag on it. There's, you know, we're not seeing a lot of secure flags. This, if I can find out that this is used uh, either something on the server side where it's, it's processing this data in a valuable mechanism or on the client side, maybe it's pulling this data out and I can inject some JavaScript to get a cross-site scripting prototype pollution. There's a lot of opportunities here. So something like this that may go under the radar to, to somebody who just hasn't seen how this can be weaponized, um, you know, it can sit there for a while. So I like this. I like seeing data stored in cookies. Um, let's check local and session storage again. A lot more in local storage this time. Most of this, so again, here's data, local storage. Um, I'd imagine this object would start to populate. It's probably just uh, taking note of where you were in the application the last time you came. Uh, query parameters. Interesting. I want to try and do some, some searches and stuff to see if we can change this value in here. Um, Strange to have this much in local storage. Uh, I'm now these dates and everything, this EN stuff. This is pretty typical. Um, we so you see this one again. Um, as these start to populate, I'm going to keep looking back here and seeing if there's something that uh, these can definitely be attack vectors as well. But I'm also looking to see if there's any sensitive data because uh, I mentioned earlier before Xfinity so rudely cut me off. Uh, you can, if, if uh, somebody has malware on their machine, this local storage is outside of the sandbox of the browser, so uh, that would be able to be exfiltrated and potentially you can use that for an idle or do something else as well. Uh, session storage, there is a little bit in session store as well. Nothing too crazy. Um, I would certainly go in here and I'm going to start changing some of these values and uh, then playing around with the app and seeing what it does with that. Does it break the app? Does, it, does the app override it? Does it start changing the way that certain mechanisms work? Um, all of that is stuff that I'm gonna look as I'm, I'm you know, dipping my toe in the water for this app. Okay, now let's see what, we'll do a little passive analysis with, with Burp Suite here. Let's get everything narrowed down in scope. Or is that, oh my gosh, that is. <laughs> I saw all this, uh, these things here and thought that I didn't set my scope. Okay, so all these grayed out URLs are just being pulled from the DOM as it's loading it up. And here's our store. This is claiming there's a session token in the URL. I'm, I'm almost certain that is not true. Wow, we have a ton of endpoints, I swear. So a lot of places that we can play here in the app itself. There's a pathword endpoint, which definitely sounds interesting. Let me get throw this out a little bit. Let's really start looking at these. I'm looking for, uh, as we expand this out, I'm looking for areas that have attack vectors. So attack vectors are an endpoint, an HTTP parameter, and some type of user controlled data. So for example, HTTP verb, 
endpoint, and uh, any one of these would be the data itself that we can attempt to, uh, to manipulate there. Now, this looks like it's just for the basic password. This looks really interesting, but we know the functionality. And this is actually a great opportunity to talk about impact a little bit. Uh, because that's something really specific to bug bounties and people that, have, that are coming from like the, the network or infrastructure pen testing or don't have as much familiarity with uh, bug bounties. It could be something that, that maybe they overlook when they're first starting, but with CWEs, common weakness enumerations, which is what we're looking for for the most part in bug bounties, that's your SQL injection, your cross-site scripting and all that, there's no set amount of impact or risk from finding that vulnerability. So. With a CV, so let's take uh, WannaCry for anybody who's been in the industry for, it was 2017, so gosh, like five years ago now, but that's, that's crazy. Um, anybody who's been in the industry for a while remembers 2017, uh, the SMB version one, uh, CV, CVE 2017-0144, I think if I remember right, which one it was, but um, basically uh, a malware started spreading, it was the first big ransomware attack, uh, started spreading all over the place, and uh, it was exploiting uh, a vulnerability in SMB version one that allowed it to jump from machine to machine. If you had SMB version one external facing, you're, you were gonna get hit and it was gonna hit, get hit with ransomware. They were gonna lock the, the whole machine, right? So a CVE, that's an example of a CVE. That has a, a very, it's binary. It's on or off, right? It's either vulnerable or if it's not. And if it's vulnerable, you're going to be able to get that remote code execution and everything. You may have some other compensating controls as far as antivirus and, and different stuff, but for the most part, hey, how's it going? How's it going? Thanks for coming, man. Hey, uh, we got the, the channel in here too, if you want to come in and talk to us. Um, what was I saying? Okay, so a CVE has just a, uh, it, it's either vulnerable, it's not vulnerable, it has a set amount of risk. That's how they have CVSS course. You know that, uh, that endpoint is going to be vulnerable. You know what you're going to get if you get it. With uh, bug bounties, CWEs, uh, so things like SQL injection and everything, the amount of risk and the amount of impact is entirely based on the context of the application. I'll tell you exactly what I mean from that. Let's take a, a you get a SQL injection in two completely different endpoints. So let's say we get a SQL injection in this login endpoint, and then we also get a SQL injection in this authenticate endpoint. But let's say that these go to two different databases. So this login endpoint here with our SQL injection, this is their main database. So now with that SQL injection, we have the ability to exfiltrate customer data from that. We have the ability to possibly change customer data. We can take over accounts. We can uh, steal passwords and use them in other things. If it's a hash, we can brute force it offline. We have a lot of opportunity. There's a huge amount of impact from the SQL injection that we just found here because the database that we're injecting into has a bunch of really valuable stuff for me as an attacker and for the company itself, obviously. Now, if we have the other one over here, this Authenticate, maybe this one goes to a, a DynamoDB and AWS, just a small database that's set up to do one thing only, and it just stores these passwords and stuff. So if we can inject in there, we can't touch any customer data. All we can touch is these little passwords for the shops to get in or, or even something smaller than that. Maybe it's literally just date time objects. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, you may think that you can use the tracking cookies to get an injection uh, into something, but you end up injecting into just like a completely worthless, like a, a Redis, you know, database or something like that. So. Um, it's, it's all about impact with, with bug bounty. So as I'm looking through this, as I'm trying to find, um, you know, places I could possibly exploit, I'm trying to find what is closest to that impact. What, what's going to get me closest to the, uh, the, uh, there you go, Steve, you, you tested well. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that was for sure. Um, it, it gets you closer to the, uh, data that the customer cares about. And the more that you can show impact, the closer that you get to the stuff that that customer cares about, the more money you're gonna get, the more you're gonna be able to show impact, the more bounties you're gonna get. So that is the, um, always have that in mind when you're doing bug bounty hunting as you're looking around. We don't just wanna look for like a SQL injection or a remote code execution or something. You know, you may get a remote code execution, but it's in a Lambda that's completely isolated. I might, might, not do, might not do anything to you. Whereas you can get an IDOR, an indirect object reference, but you steal an admin's password with that, all of a sudden you've got a lot more impact. So it's all about impact with bug bounties. It's all about impact. Always have that in your, in your mind as you're going through. OK, 
Okay, so I want to look through some of the other things that we can do in the admin panel. I'm, I'm starting to take note of the different mechanisms that, that I would want to target. Uh, so we, we have a setup here. It looks like just kind of setting up payments and everything. Um, eventually, I would want to get to that point. If you have anything that has uh, different, uh, like where it requires a credit card or anything, if you can't actually do that with a fake card or like go buy a Visa gift card or something, those do not get tested very well. So that can be very interesting. Uh, looks like I can create over. Let's see. We'll just start sending some things through. And all I'm doing while I'm clicking on these is I'm populating my site now. Create a new customer, John Smith. Sure, they're going to do those. I'll try to select and change as many things as possible. John's company. Sure. What? And we'll do. Uh, do a 254 number for uh, Colleen, Texas, and then we'll just try something there. We'll see if it'll let us save this. Perfect, it will. Okay, so that would have given us some more forms to play with here. So we go back to Burp. We should see, how did that go through? Yeah, so this is a mechanism that I would definitely uh, want to test. Um, so I'm gonna send this to the repeater. This is gonna be the first one that I'm gonna be testing today, and we'll talk about why here in a minute. So, um, I don't think we need to title it anything yet. Um, yeah, so looking through this request, we're making a post request. That means that we're probably going to be getting closer to, uh, as far as CRUD, create, read, update, and delete, we're probably not doing read. We're probably going to be either creating, updating, or deleting. Pretty obvious what we just did there. We created, if you see uh, customer create, we created a new customer object. So we can assume what's happening here. Uh, based on what we've seen, it appears that sending this request with this data, it should be creating a, an object in the database that can later be accessed. Now, we haven't found out what kind of database it is yet. Um, when I see JSON, I'm hoping for NoSQL, like a Mongo database. I'm much more comfortable with that, um, at least in, in the management perspective, but from an offensive side, uh, regular SQL database, especially Postgres, give us a lot more to play with. So let's try and send one again, and let's see what happens. And this is an API. So this is considered API testing. So uh, what we're doing, what I like to do with API testing is, first of all, find out how it works, then try and break it. And once I break it, I'm gonna see if I can weaponize the break. And uh, if I can figure out why it's breaking, I can try and you know get something out of that. Um, so we, we know that we're creating an object. I would want to see what happens when it gets a malformed object. Do we get uh, any strange error messages or anything back? Uh, what happens if it has two of the exact same uh, keys? What happens if it expects, you know, right here it expects a Boolean value, but maybe instead this is a string? So we'll send that and see if it, it doesn't like that. Uh, it doesn't appear to have any issue. And now, okay, so this is something, this is, this is interesting. So you see here, before tax exempt, that was a, a Boolean value, but it's accepting a string. So what kind of an impact will that be? Uh, you know, on the server side, will that break something? We'll, we'll have to find out, but we have just poisoned this object in the database with a type that, that uh, the developers most likely did not expect, you know, tax exempt, uh, unless there's some other option besides true or false. They probably were not expecting this. So um, we can try, let's try to add just additional things, additional uh, key value pairs. We're still getting a 200, so we're not having any issues there. And we can actually inject that as well. Okay, so let's come back to the, the app itself because it's reflecting all of that here. What happens when we refresh it? There's our customer. I didn't see the, well, there's the information again. 
So I'm trying to figure out how this is being rendered. You know, is this, is there some type of templating engine? Is it, I mean, you know, yeah, we looked at it. Okay, so this is just like the last one. So this is, this is React. So this data here is almost definitely gonna be stored in props or state and we can come over and see in our React tools. Uh, how much of a mess is it gonna be? They're just keys there. Ah, uh, there's more data. I don't know. Should be stored in here somewhere. Ah, there we go. There it is. Okay. So we don't see the additional key value pair that we injected into this. So what that tells me, where'd it go? What that tells me is that there's a React uh, handler in the component that when this loads, it pulls the object from the database and it accesses the values that it needs and it puts them into state here in the uh, array. Interesting that these are not, this is not an object with key value pairs, so I'm sure you could you know, this you possibly reorder them or something. I, I find that kind of strange. I don't think it's the best way to do that, but that's fine. Um, we also don't know if it's actually been injected. It's entirely possible that this is just reflecting everything back to us. So I'm gonna try and find somewhere to where I can see this full object. Uh, maybe if there's a get request, something I can try that. Let's, let's actually do that. Let's send this to repeater. And I'm gonna change this request method and let's just try and see what happens okay so that endpoint does not exist um interesting that's a 404 that gives me some insight into the tech stack makes me think there's a javascript back end as well um more i don't know what the right word traditional is not the right word but so like your net apps your java apps your more legacy technology stacks uh, typically, they will, uh, PHP as well, typically they don't, uh, unless you specifically say, they don't care what the method is. When you get these 404s for different HTTP verbs, a lot of times that's, that's Node, JavaScript. Um, Django doesn't care either, if I remember right. Yeah, so I don't know for sure, but looking at everything is telling me so far that this at least parts of it would have, have Node, although I know the other one said Ruby, so uh, maybe Ruby's on here as well. Okay, and we'll be reducing a lot of those cookies there. That's kind of a bit of a pain, but I like that. I like that mechanism. I like being able to add it. Um, we've got a search. Ooh, merge two customers into one. You can request data. Being able to delete customers uh, for another another uh, person's store would probably be really valuable too. Let's see what that request looks like. Hopefully that'll let us see if that was stored in the database too. Okay. I wanna go look at that GraphQL query and see if these operations are tied to it because it, it seems like these are being repurposed uh, through a microservice into, into that. Is this here? Did these all go through before? Or was that when I was navigating? Where's the where's the delete? I don't see the delete event. I need to re I need to recreate that. We'll have to actually watch it. All right, let's add a customer. I think it matters if it's real or not. Uh, let's see if there's any client side validation or any validation at all, really. Actually, no, let's give it a battle. Let's, let's just give it absolutely terrible stuff.
Okay, so there's a little bit of client side validation there. Let's see if that. I didn't see it. Okay. All right, I'll give you another one. You like that? There you go. Yeah, there's all these different operations that are going through when you do it. Okay, yeah. So this is where our request is going. You can see that it's saying, so this is 100%, this is, this is going to a GraphQL endpoint. I mean, you can see the query right there. So we've got the data. Um, you can see the type is mutation, which is telling us that it's doing, it, it's changing the data. Okay, so we would imagine I would imagine that the same thing is going to happen when we delete the customer. All right, let's bring this back over and let's go with a intercept here. Okay, so here's our delete customer request there. And so here's another opportunity for an IDOR. Uh, most likely, it looks like we've got a customer ID number. This is going to be taken in the back and done that. So, you know, I'm asking uh, what, what the developers should have done is there should be some way to validate this through the session. So probably through one of these cookies, it's going to have a session ID or something that will reach into the database. It will pull that data back out and say, this customer should only have access to this one customer object and uh, or this admin shall have access to this one customer object and should not be able to affect anything with outside of this instance of Shopify. And uh, so if I were to, let's send this over to repeater after we'll test it, but let's just try going over. I'm making an assumption here that that's exactly what that is. Let's see what happens when we send it through. Awesome, that one says customer can't be found. Uh, let's see. So what I'm eventually gonna do is I'm going to, oh, I just saw that thing. what I'm eventually gonna do is I'm gonna create two different stores. There's gotta be an arson one and an arson two. And then that way I can see if I can delete, um, delete customers for the other one. So from arson one, can I send this request? And I, can I delete customers for arson two? Um, that's where a lot of the most valuable testing is going to be. So we'll keep looking around for a while, but once I get that set up, that's what we'll, what we'll see some good stuff. Oh. Let me take five minutes. Just run down. I'm going to grab the puppy too, because he wanted to hang out there, but I want to get him up with me. Um, I will be right back and we'll keep looking around for some interesting mechanisms.
All right, got fresh coffee and a puppy. A heavy puppy. Oh boy, why don't you show me how you bought? Where's your bed? Oh, there's your bed. All right, let's get you laying down there. I'll get back to it. Oh, thank you, Owen. Yeah, I just saw you sent that link. Okay, so I want to show what I was talking about before I left there. I want to, I want to get a second store set up now so that we can go ahead and start uh, at least, I don't, you know, it, it's hard to really do live IDOR testing on stream because there's no, there's no, but you either find it or you don't. So I'll show a couple really uh, simple examples and then I'll probably move on because I don't want to end up disclosing a vulnerability that I'm not allowed to disclose as we find it. Um, but happy to answer any questions about how I do that testing because um, I think that's probably one of the most effective ways to do bug bounty testing. It's not often that you get to be able to set up instances of an application like this. It gives you a lot of, of power, a lot of options as a bug bounty researcher. So let's, let's do that. I want to make sure everybody on here knows how to do that. Go ahead and get the hacker one thing set up. I'm telling you, I've got to get back into shape. I'm like going up and down those stairs. I'm out of breath and it's, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good at all. All right. Copy this link address here. Man, It's finally a nice day here in, in Houston. So I'm going to uh, go for a run after I do this stream. All right. Let's get, uh, I don't know if I can make multiple stores. I think this is the same one I used. Yeah, it is. Okay, so let's click on this. Now, do I have the ability to make a second store? You'd think so. I mean, the tab is stores, right? It's, it's plural. Yeah, so it should be able to do it. Oh, this is great. Okay, so I'm going to make a second one exactly how I did before. So create a development store, um, create a store to test and build. Um, I want to get as close to the developer functionality as possible. That's going to give me uh, a lot more options, a lot more insight into the objects that are in the database, etc. So this one's going to be Arson2. Arson2. Uh, there's the latest build here. They have some interesting developer features that I may try out, but I want feature parity between these two right now while I'm testing IDOR. So let's do that. Um, you cannot see my screen, can you? Thank you very much. <laughs> Good grief. I, think I, I do that at least once a stream, Scuba. I, I do that at least once a stream. Um, okay, well, once this is created, I'll go back and show what I did a minute ago. <laughs> One day I'm going to get the hang of all this, I promise. Okay. So here you can see it's redirected us to the second one. Look at that, and this is so great. Be because it's all under admin.shopify, it's actually going to be really easy to test between these. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. Um, this is great. This is great. This is going to be a really fun uh, app to test on. Um, I love programs like this. I, I may really start digging into the Shopify uh, program, which I haven't before. This is really cool. Um, anyway, let me just show, and then I'll come back to this. Just so you, you can see what I did there. Um, add a store, create a development store right there. I'm looking up at my screen, make sure people can see me. Uh, create a store to test and build. And then I just do, we would make this one Arson3. It automatically populates that. And then under the developer builds, like I said, they have a little bit of additional functionality there. Um, but I just did that. So hopefully I can get right back to where I was. Nope, doesn't like me to navigate like that. That's okay. Should be able to just do this. It should be all in the same session, possibly. Yes, it is. Okay. Man, that's um. So that's good. It's all in the same session, but it's also going to make it so we can't test the items. Because we're on the same, uh, 
we're going to have to do two different accounts to do that. That's the only way that that, that would work. Um, so, the, and the reason for that is, you see, like I can I can go back and forth between my arson and arson two stores here. So that tells me that they're under the same session, they're under the same access controls. I don't, I don't have to log out of them. Hey, thank you for following. Oh, who? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, oh, there's the name right there. Big unlucky, man. I, I appreciate that. I always love to see Tank's little face pop up there, too. Oh, I got a bunch of new um, new gifts and stuff now. So I got to be able to, I think, like new options and stuff now that I'm affiliate. I got to get more recordings of them doing cute stuff so that it pops up. Uh, all right, let's see if we can go back and. I think we just got to use maybe not two different emails because look, they had, that's not it. Where was I at? Why did that take me there? Oh, this, I guess it's just allowing me to change my, uh, my password or change these settings. Um, let's log out. Log in. me right back in here. I was hoping to get, there, there was a part I saw before where you could possibly do different instances of it, so I was hoping maybe that would work. But it does look like we're going to need two different emails in order to do the testing that I want to do. So um, it's going to take a little more time, but let's, let's do that. And actually, so I, I am going to take, well, I'll take my screen off when I need to, just to enter some personal information and stuff. So um, I'm going to join now log in through Google, and I'll just use a, a different email here. I've already got one for the bug bounty, so. Okay, let me bring this back off here. I'll fill in this. So this business name's gonna be arson2. Actually, I don't know why. I can share my screen on here. There's nothing, nothing public. I mean, I'm not gonna give it a real address, so. Um, I think this has a Google API again. No, it doesn't. I think I used something like a random thing back down in the office. I'll just do that, just a random number, uh, and then we'll go. Galveston, Texas. Close enough to a real one. Only the number doesn't exist. Uh, yep, building apps for the Shopify store. I don't have any apps yet. These are all the settings I have before. I want as much feature parity as possible. I read and agreed. View the dashboard. Let's go. Okay, so now, yes, and we've lost access to this. Good, so let's move away from here. We still should be able to access this. Yeah, okay, so we've got a completely different session, which obviously we've got my Shopify and Shopify, so a completely different session there. Uh, so let's get an incognito. Uh, private window, whatever they call it in this here. There you go, there you go. And now, We have no stores. All right, so if we come over here, all right, so I'm gonna move everything there. Okay. So let me take my screen off just for one second while I get this one set up. Here, I'm chatting, you can at least. I do love multi-factor authentication, even though it does tend to be a pain sometimes. It really has kind of changed the game, though. Boo, show us your password. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure I'd be fired <laughs> if I did that. Um, uh, my company frowns upon their security engineering manager sharing out their password on Twitch streams. But uh, who knows? I may, uh, I may trip up at some point. <laughs> okay, let's start that here. Um, Gotta get all the way into this darn uh, or I was not ready 
to do this at all. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, how do I say that? Is it is it Felite? I don't. I'm not very good with uh, screen names, so please feel free to square me away there. Where in the world is this doing? Olaf? What is this thing doing? Bit more personal information stuff we gotta move through here. I like this one. There, that should be good there. Both fee and phi. Okay, okay. Does it does it stand for anything? I know I got some buddies up in Philly. I don't know if you're uh, you're in the area. Okay, so this should be coming up. Now we're stuck on a call back here. Bring the screen back up. So this should be logging in. I don't really know what it's doing here. Let's try just going to partner, see if it'll. This is not the easiest thing to, to navigate. taking me back here. What is this thing doing? I just went through and filled all this out and signed in and it just froze up on the callback and then kicked it back. Okay, let's try this again. It's using it off. or what's going on, but anyway, I think that's probably enough time. I'll fight with that here in a little bit. Um, yeah, I need to find out. For some reason, it's not like in the incognito window. Um, I don't know why that would be, if there's some type of set, maybe there's some type of cooking setting or something that is kicking it back, but um, if that doesn't work, that's why I've got the crazy setup here. So um, worst case scenario, it'd be hard to show and stream, but I'll end up getting an instant setup over here. We don't have to worry about that. We can do virtual machines to do it. We got a ton of different options, but ultimately what I want is I want two completely separate instances of this, uh, this admin panel that we've written here. So <laughs> I think I did something. Um, I don't really know what happened here. I, I desynchronized up. So uh, I definitely want to kind of play around with this mechanism too. Uh, again, like I said, anytime looking at, I'm looking at, did it break? And then if it broke, let me figure out why it broke uh, so I can try and weaponize it. So here, I mean, we had the two stores in here. Now all of a sudden it's saying we don't have any stores. So there's something going on with our session, which makes me think that something's been desynchronized. Maybe there's uh, data stored in the client side, also in the server side, and something's not matching up on their end. I don't really know, but this is unique. Yeah, we definitely did something. I guess because, why is it still attaching it to this, the bug bounty email? Let's just see what happens. Okay, so we're still, we're still in the same one. So we're still seeing like, no, the other ones exist. Yes, yeah, I, man, something got messed up. Okay, so, so again, I'm excited about that because this is, uh, this is a pretty important mechanism creating these stores and if we can break it, there could be some opportunities there. At some point, because all of this is under the same admin.shopify.com, uh, did you make the other store with the, the same account? No, so I did my, I've got an arson.bugbounty uh, Gmail account and then I've got an arson.evolve Gmail account and I did them with both. So um, the second one that I just created was for the, uh, uh, this one right here, the Evolve uh, account. Um, yeah, no, something is, is, something in the session has been desynchronized. Very cool. 
All right, well, let's just completely, I gotta just completely get back in here, I think. Let's do this. Let's just clear out all of our cookies. Delete all. Reload it. Now I'm under the new account, Scuba. So yeah, I created the new account. I must have had two session tokens. So maybe when you create, well no, because that would have been added into here. What would have caused that to desynchronize? Because everything that I was doing, it has to be tied to like the partners. Yeah, something's definitely up with the session. It must be, um, it must be tied to the, uh, like that first partners.shopify.com. There must be some type of synchronization between that and the admin. I mean, of course there is because it redirects from partners to admin. You remain your session. Um, Scuba, I wonder if the, I wonder where it's scoped. Let's see if we can find where the session to token is scoped. I wonder if maybe they're scoped to the same parent domain and, and that's the reason that we're seeing that strange thing. Uh, so we have, oh, we have this master device ID that's scoped to the parent domain. Uh, this is just a Boolean value. Um, you know, I, so for this, one thing I'm definitely going to do uh, is send a couple requests and change this. Um, I'll probably try a couple different words too is Shopify administrator things. This is obviously doing, it's, it's got, um, oh, I don't remember what it was before I made it, screw it up again. Merchant, uh, ENT, ENT, who knows, we're gonna find out. Um, but you know, we've got a one, that's a Boolean value. So um, this is affecting something as it's loading. Um, did you have a session for the first email when you made this to work in a second email? Yeah, I, I think that's what happened. I think I still, I definitely still had a session on the first email. So I think instead of uh, you know checking for that, I, I don't know. It just it just uh, added it. it. Like I said, it looked like we had two session tokens, and it looked like it didn't know where to pull it from. Something was definitely desynchronized. But yeah, so this is doing uh, somewhere is checking to see if you're a merchant. There's got to be something else. Um, I don't know what that something else would be in an admin.shopify. It's probably. Um, Let's see what happens if we set it to zero. Let's refresh this. I don't know if it overrode it. Yeah, so it, it checks that. So, so we're sending this in a request, and then they're checking it on the server side, and they're saying, no, this is not right. Uh, it's supposed to be a one. And then it's, it's sending the set cookie header back to us. Um, but. This still seems like it could be an interesting attack vector that may be overlooked by, by other people. Um, not a lot of changes in here. Okay, so we're in our new one. That's good. We should still have, I think, the IDORs in the other one too, or the, the uh, identity other ones. Okay, so let's create arson. Oh, so the stores are consistent across, which would make sense. So you're gonna be able to fuzz this and identify any other stores that you wanna target. So that's good to know. I didn't create it this way either. So hopefully this has a, this is a completely different endpoint, a completely different system to do this. We can check that a little later. I'm just playing around. Now I want to get as many of these populated as possible because um, all these are going to go directly to my sitemap over here and these are all going to be part of my, my scanning and fuzzing. Like we have a ton of other subdomains as well. That are, uh, let's see, shop by cloud. I don't know if the SVC is in scope. Um, I don't know what that is. A lot of these endpoints talking about session tokens in there. I know it's cut off, but that's I've seen that finding enough that I know what that says. A lot of options. It's a lot of options. Um, and, and the fact that they're sending this out saying we're increasing our bounties and stuff, it means that there's something that they're worried about. You know, that doesn't mean that there, some people may think that that's like, oh, they're so confident they're increasing the money. I'm telling you, that's not what they're doing. They have, they, they're seeing some things. They don't have enough 
uh, internal resources to be able to, to test this most likely. They have some concerns, they have new functionality coming out, maybe they're seeing some, some issues but, but uh, that they think are vulnerable and they really want to hammer into it. They're looking to drive engagement to this program because they have concerns. So it's very easy to see programs that are advertising these types of uh, uh, higher bounties and think, oh, you know, I don't want to go do that because that probably means they're so confident. It's the exact opposite. Now you're obviously going to have a lot more competition there, but with an application of this size, I have no concerns. I mean, there's stuff here. It doesn't matter how long people are doing. Shopify is a huge company and they are constantly developing and adding things and changing things. You know, this is not some old piece of software to where they're pushing out a new release every six months. You know, it's constant. That's how all developers work now, CICD. Um, so I'm sure there's stuff here. I'm sure there's stuff here. We just have to find the mechanisms that other people haven't uh, messed with yet. We have to find stuff that, that it looks interesting. All right. I don't think. Let's see if there's any. CM. Okay, so just a basic regex, probably. Let's just see. No, I'm going to create the story. Anytime I see client side validations, I immediately want to see if they have validations on the server side as well. So I'll, you know, if it says, okay, the zip code has to be a five digit number. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're already getting some, uh, some issues here, which is good. Uh, I wonder what that is. Let's go look in the proxy. Everything got a 200 response. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that means. Identify kill switch, but uh, okay, here's, yeah, it looks like it's pulling to get some type of error. Whoa! Is that a stack trace? No, not really. Is this languages? Just different text? Uh, yeah, no, 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 nothing. Got excited for a minute. I don't know what broke. I don't see anything here that's an issue aside from that one thing that said kill switch. Um, maybe there's some type of client side validation. Uh, Maybe coming from that. Maybe that's looking for. Oh. Uh, oh, oh, it was already created. So maybe the store already exists and just hiccuped. Let's just go back to the back to the main page here. I think we're good. Yeah, let's take it still. So there's Arson, and then ah, so maybe I have to do some other things in here. This did not happen with the other one. So before it automatically set it up, when I went through here, now it's not doing that. You know, I wonder if it's because of the password. Why don't we set that again? I can go to the store itself, right? Why do it keep taking me into here? Here we go, preferences. This is, I think, the last thing that I need to do. Oh no, it's already got the password. So what is it through here? Maybe it's just this.
It's an automatically generated one there. I don't want any captcha on my forms. Oh, we just come over here, I guess. So I guess the password protects it when you're not ready. Okay, here we go. All right, so we got our arson three and our arson. So we've got two completely different, uh, two completely different stores here. So um, that will allow us to do that testing. Again, I would want to. Uh, I really like to do it between the admin panels. That seems like it's a lot more interesting. But. Okay. Let's move into the store itself. Because I think, um, you know, again, the authentication for this uh, admin and the kind of wonkiness with the session tokens is definitely interesting to me. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other things in here. The finances, let's just, let's look through here as well before we do anything else. This is probably going to be where the main area is. Uh, add a payment. How... I don't know if there'd be a lot of ways to weaponize this. So this is going to create an object in the background, or I mean in the database, a credit card object. Um, the main thing I would want to test here is PCI uh, controls. So if anybody is not familiar, the at least in the United States, we have a regulation called PCI DSS, the payment card information. And I don't remember what DSS stands for, data security service probably, or something like that. But anyway. If a uh, company, like an e-commerce company or anything, if they store credit card data, they are subject to uh, very strict uh, regulations about how that data can be stored, what data can be stored, uh, what can happen to it in transit, when it needs to be deleted, all that type of stuff. So um, whenever I'm dealing with an e-commerce site, and I know it's not the most fun thing in the world, But it is a really good idea to just get brushed up on some of the main uh, requirements for PCI DSS. Uh, things like, you know, you can't store the credit card with uh, the credit card number, the full credit card number. You definitely can't have it with additional information. It, it, there's, it, it depends on the, the context. It takes a little bit of learning. But this is a fantastic way to build impact because there's something like a simple IDOR, indirect object reference, to where you can access data. Well, if you can access that data, that data may not be that valuable, but let's say in that you can see that they are not uh, keeping with, or this would uh, have them not be able to keep their PCI DSS uh, certification. That has a huge impact to them because if they lose that, they can no longer uh, operate. You know, So something that may be a, a small impact to a company that doesn't worry about PCI DSS, all of a sudden, is something that would be uh, it would cost them you know millions and millions of dollars and so they're going to pay a, a major bounty out so potentially when you're looking for those big bounties bypassing compliances you know if you can find a way to show them that a simple vulnerability would have a major disruption to their business and cost them a lot of money then you can start to get some bounties from that too doesn't have to always be this crazy technical you know chain of, of exploits um, just think about what's important to the company Think about what their goals are. Where are they trying to go? What's going to stop them from getting there? What do they need to continue operating? And you attack those and show impact through those, and you can uh, you'll you'll be able to to get them engaged uh, a lot more than if you just come and say, hey, look at this you know cool thing, and I got into the database, but there's nothing nothing really in there. Uh, anything to do with money when this is loaded again this is a react component so there's going to be a call coming out from the client side most likely to the graphql api to pull all these values back so i would be testing that I'm, I, the graphql endpoint 100 percent that's i'm going to dig into that um i can find some resources for uh graphql testing where was it here was it in this one Here's an example of one area to do it. So in the admin, it doesn't look like they have a specific uh, a specific endpoint for it. In the store itself, I think they do. Oh, okay. Well, here we go. Okay, so API, Shopify, and then we have this here. This is also interesting. So the path parameter here ties it directly to the store. 
and that's all under the same domain as well. So this is a, a great spot in the admin panel for iDoors. Great, great spot in the admin panel for iDoors because I know that any request coming from Arson3 or coming to Arson3, this one right here, this should not be able to pull any data. This is creating the account too. It's not good. So I, I need to grab a, a read, uh, or something besides a create. I need to grab a read, update, or delete uh, request from this. But I would grab something from Arson3 and then send that out and say, okay, let's just change this to Arson2 and see, because I know that that request should not be able to go to it. Because it shouldn't, my, my arson three stores under a completely separate email than the, the arson two and arson one. So I love this for IDORs. I love that it's going GraphQL. There's a lot of complexity here. It looks very simple, but there's a lot of complexity to the infrastructure and what's happening in the application. You got to think about the logic to this is, so when I make this request, let's go back to the actual request. So when I make this request, the first thing it's doing, it's all going to this admin.shopify.com. So that's going to hit, uh, we will just, I don't know what their infrastructure is, so I'm most familiar with AWS, we can pretend it's AWS, but that's going to hit uh, like an application load balancer or, or something similar, and it will say, okay, if there's multiple applications, virtual hosting, it'll send it to the one with that, but most likely it's just one application, right? So it gets the ELB, sends it back to the admin.shopify.com app here. Um, from there, it goes to the API, Shopify, and then a path parameter endpoint. And within this route, it's going to be saying, okay, take this here and then send this to the database and pull me back all of the information for that store. It's, it, this is being used somewhere in that. I don't know if it's being used anywhere else. Let me see if it's in the actual GraphQL query. Uh, it is, but it's for all the other stuff that I did. So the the answer, what was that the answer? That should have been the uh, the website that I put in there that's calling it an answer. It's kind of funny. It looks like a security question thing. Um, I wonder if that's a logic issue that they have. I don't know. But I, I don't see it anywhere else. So they must be validating this somewhere. That's a possibility of bypass access controls. It's pulling it from the parameter. There's a lot of options for injection, for encoding. Um, so I would select this here. I'm not going to do it because we don't know what it's going to what it's going to find. I want to do it. You know, I'm, I don't want to find anything too major on the stream. But um, in Berk Suite here, we can highlight this, right click, and just hit Do an Active uh, Scan on the Insertion Point. So we can hit Select Scan Insertion Point. We can go through and, and actually run it. If you have an active scan already running, so um, I should find something I can just play with to do the, the demonstrations. But um, if I did have an active scan already running, let's scan the fave icon. How about that? Okay. So we have a, an active scan running. Then I can just select this one individual point, rock, right click, and I can just add that to the task. So what that's going to do is it's only going to run scans against this one individual point. It's not going to hit all of the path. It's not going to hit the verb. It's not going to hit these get parameters. It's not going to hit the cookies. It's not going to hit the headers. It's not going to hit any of the GraphQL endpoint. So this is uh, typically what I see um, with somebody who's a little more experienced with burp. Um, they can be much more efficient in the way that they test by just targeting individual points like that. Um, you know, you can target subdomains. Uh, you can get very, very granular with the way you're testing. Uh, okay. All right. We're going to move away from the admin panel. Let's see if there's anything from the passive analysis been picked up. Like I said, I, these are almost never valid. Um, you're not going to find a company like Shopify that's putting session tokens in a, in a get parameter in the URL. Uh, I don't care at all about the CDN. And here's the store. So let's start looking at what the store. Gosh, there's so much going on here. Let's move away from Burp and go to the store itself. All right, so we've got tabs along the top, three initial ones, contact, set this through real quick. Let's try it without correctly formatting it. Man, this is like, for anybody that's been doing the, the Burp uh, Mystery Labs with me for the Port Swigger certification, this is, <laughs> this is really reminiscent of it. Okay, so here's the class I think. It's like all of their uh, all of their labs have this exact same thing. Um, okay, all right. 
sign on all those. That should be fine right there. Um, and you know what? Let's do this. I don't think Alex is on here right now, but I know he was asking me about XSS Hunter. So if you haven't gotten this set up, uh, Truffle Security has uh, XSS Hunter. They basically just did a fork of um, the other instance of it. They got it set up for you. I'm so happy they did this. Uh, Truffle Security, major props. Really, really appreciate it. This is one of my favorite tools for bug bounty hunting. If anybody is not familiar with this and you're on the stream, uh, this is for testing blind cross-site scripting. So what it does is you can see these, these you know, different payloads for cross-site scripting. And I've got a bunch of more granular custom ones that I've built too in my uh, scan templates. Um, but these are all trying to get a cross-site scripting fire. When it, when, it, when it executes, it will send a request to this endpoint here and you'll get a bunch of information about where it executed, when it executed, what IP address it came from, what was the local page that it came from. There's all types of great JavaScript that, that executes once this is loaded to where it can gather information about it and send it back to us. So what this allows me to do is take these payloads and just hammer them across an application. And then hopefully, I'm not looking for anything myself. I'm not looking to see if that, that cross-site scripting payload is being reflected or, or sent back or it's fired or anything. What I'm looking for, or what I'm hoping for, is that something like this were a contact, this must go back to me somewhere. I must be able to come back here and see, uh, maybe it goes through an email or something, but I'm hoping it's in this admin portal so that maybe one of those cross-site scriptings would fire when an admin is coming back to look at this, this thing entirely separate from what I can see, and then I'll get a notification that that request sent. Great way to get high impact vulnerabilities. I promise a lot of companies do not put any type of security controls on their internal applications. They'll just build like quick, quick dashboards and everything. They're building them themselves. And you know, there's not a lot of thought to that. But those are all injection points. If you can go through the application, you can store data. A lot of times those dashboards will show that data to you. Uh, and so that can, you can eventually get it there. You send it to the application, goes to the database, the dashboard pulls it from the database, shows that payload, executes cross-site scripting. You've now got a cross-site scripting happening internal to their network. Huge impact, a lot of money. Really, really good, uh, good way to get some high value uh, bones for a very low amount of effort. And actually, I'll show you real quick exactly how I do that is with, um, with the Burt Bounty extension. I'll have to actually install it here. I think I've got it, or active, load it rather. I think I've got it installed. Do I? Maybe I don't. Maybe I don't. Okay, well, if you don't, then just come over here and scroll down to Burt Bounty. Yeah, I do have it installed. Am I just missing it? Y'all are probably looking on the scan going, man. You're out of your mind. It's probably like right there. There it is. Okay. Let's get that loaded. And Burt Bounty lets you create your own custom scan checks that you can run. It's a cool little tool. It's not the most stable tool in the world, um, but it does uh, it does work. And you can see here, these are the ones that I've created. Um, so the blind cross-site scripting, we go to edit, just so you can see what it looks like. We've got all of those different payloads and I have them set so that you, know, you can see append, insert, replace. Um, so these will just be included as part of the scan checks. So we don't hit all these all over the place. Um, user agent is one of the, one of my favorite things to do this. Um, so make sure, make sure that it's going to all the headers. Uh, headers can be really useful. If, um, one, one fun one that I got one time was, uh, the company had a requirement that all of you had to use a custom header while you were testing. And I got the blind cross-site scripting through that custom header. So they had built a dashboard to, to see all of the different uh, researchers that were doing that and it would have you know information stuff. So I started fuzzing those endpoints that I knew they would be tracking on their end and figured it would be on some type of custom thing. And it lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> they, they only paid me for one, which I was a little sad about because it was all in the whole thing. But uh, it, was a, it was a pretty good one. It was a pretty good one. And I love... They were, we were just joking in the, in the back and forth. I was like, yeah, y'all y'all set it up for me. You you built the mechanism uh, for me to do it. I thought that was fun. All right, that's enough of, of uh, blind XSS. All right, 
right, let's keep clicking through. Uh, again, search sections with possibly this. Now, uh, this goes back to where I was talking about impacts before. Um, probably not going to be a lot of impact here if we can get a uh, an injection, um, at least not from the data itself, because you can probably see most of this data. Now, if we can manipulate the data, actually, maybe yeah, I should really make that clarification. If we can read the data, it's probably not that big of a deal. We're probably going to be able to read all of the data here in the catalog as well. If we can update the data in an e-commerce site, super, super interesting to me, right? Because each one of these products that there that's that's in here, and I'm certainly going to be adding products and trying this, each one of those products is going to have a, a value for the price. So if I can update that object, can I make the price zero? I don't know if that's a 200k bounty, but that's that's probably worth a bit. That's that's would be pretty big if anyone can buy any product on a Shopify site for free. I imagine the the vast majority of customers would be pretty upset about that. And that's what Shopify cares about. That's what they're trying to mitigate with this bug bounty program. So um, that's something that I'm going to be trying to test. Uh, can I update uh, values in the database to where I can manipulate the price? I like that. I really hope we can get something. Um, now it's React. So most likely, let's just come here. We won't be able to see much, but I want to see the components. Okay, this this is not using React. The other one was. Interesting. So let's. Maybe just some some JavaScript in the front there. It doesn't look. It looks like the store is actually much less complicated than the admin panel there, which which would make sense. But the reason that's important is if this was React then I would imagine that all the products would just be pulled initially and this search was just doing a dot map or a dot filter in there, which means we don't have the ability to communicate with the database. Um, the way that we can test that is we can come in here to the network and we'll just do a test, we'll, we'll run a search and see if it actually sends any requests and it looks like it does it preemptively. So it's, oh, at least for the suggest. Uh, we've got some some good stuff. Good. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at that in a second. I like that there. I'll explain why in a minute. Yeah, these are definitely these are network calls. So we have the option to to possibly get some injections in there. Why aren't we making a call to this well known endpoint? Oh, what's up, Steve? Um, thoughts on network versus endpoint security? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, network. Uh, I mean, so endpoint security would be like like host based firewall compared to a, a network based firewall. I think they don't do a lot of endpoint security. Uh, I mean, of course you do, but I don't know. I don't think they're comparable. They're two sides of the same coin. You know. I don't think there's really a versus. I think it's, uh, you know, you should have, have both. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But either way, both of those are probably gonna be a little bit left to AppSec. I mean, uh, you would definitely have like network security for application security, you got a web application firewall, um, you know, to protect requests that are coming in from the client. But like, that, there's not a ton that you can do to stop uh, somebody from accessing it because that's the nature of a web application, very different than, than an endpoint. Um, now, if you're talking about endpoint security as far as the server itself, I mean, there's some things that you can do like RASP, uh, real-time application security protection to, to try and stop um, somebody from, like if the application is not supposed to spin off a new process, you can, you can put some endpoint security on there to make sure it doesn't. But honestly, I, I think um, function as a service, you know, AWS Lambdas and things like that, that's a really great way to mitigate any, uh, any issues on the endpoint. Uh, just because the endpoint, it, it, like if you're not familiar with lambdas, it's just a function. It just kind of spins up and goes away. Um, so there's not, it, it doesn't have a lot of scope uh, that it can, it can affect there. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. Let me know if you have any more questions or anything. I'll see if, see if I can uh, expand on that. Uh, okay, so this is making network calls. So I do believe that this has a chance to go in there. I also wanna, I wanna grab this one over here. Yeah, this here, I love this. 
Here's another one that I'm definitely going to do another testing or a lot of testing on. And the reason for that is very, very strange to see get parameters here with this. Um, so let's grab this whole URL and let's send it up to the decoder. And we'll look through it a little bit. We'll do a smart decode just to get rid of that. Right, so what we have here, this is, did we figure out what's in the back end? This is really making me think this is a, a Node Express application. I don't know for sure, but very rare to see this in, I, the only other place I usually see this is, is dot, uh, dot .NET apps. And this, this ain't a dot .NET app. There's zero chances of dot .NET app. So I think it has to be Node. But anyway, what, what happens here is if this is Express, Express actually takes this syntax and it turns it into an object. So request, or Express is going to split off all of these query parameters here, and then it's going to start turning this into an object. So Q will be the key, and then arson will be the value. Now right here, you actually, this is syntax to do a nested object. So we can do resources, um, this would open up into an object, and then the key value pair would be type and product. Same here for limit and for. Very strange syntax for get requests. So that could potentially open up the opportunity for prototype pollution. So the way that I'm going to test that, I'm not going to do it on the stream, but you can go and do that right now. You can do it in my shop if you want, because I, you know, the password is just arson. You can literally type <laughs> arson3.myshopify and go test on the same one I am. Uh, but what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm hoping that on the server side, they have what's called a deep merge or a recursive merge. And that opens up the possibility for prototype pollution. And if you're not familiar with prototype pollution, I'll explain what I mean by that. Or deep merges for all that. Um, so we, we have a, a JSON object uh, that's being created there. So maybe a better area to kind of show an example, but I will leave that. Anyway, so we have a JSON object that's being created from these request parameters here. That is being processed on this endpoint and it's you know populating this in some way or going into the database, etc. I'm hoping that when this is turned from query parameters into an object, it's merged with another object, which means we, you know, something else, when it's merged, it's just all the key value pairs go into one object. And in that process, I'm hoping that the developers had a need to do what's called a deep merge. And that means that nested objects within both, ob both objects are going to be merged as well. It's a very common use case. It's a very well-known uh, uh, need uh, and algorithm. What happens as a side effect from a deep merge is that if I were to come in and put proto here, that could potentially allow me to add key value pairs to the prototype of all objects that are instantiated within running memory in that scope. So this right here is most likely going to be on the server side. So that's going to be a server side prototype pollution vulnerability, which means that let's say after I get that pollution, and actually let me show you, for anybody who doesn't, let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. So if you don't know what Proto is, this is a, a JavaScript console here. If you're not familiar with Proto, every object that exists, so a JavaScript object, because uh, of what's called inheritance, which is an object that's built on another object, it has this proto object that it inherits. And that's the prototype right here. So this is just, what is, what is every object able to do? And one great example is the two string function right here. This is one that we love to execute with, proto, or to exploit with prototype pollution. So every object that's created has the ability to do a two string. So if I do um, variable uh, example equals, and then let's just do a very simple key value pair, arson equals arson, right? So do that. Now we see our object, arson equals object, or arson equals object. Open this up. We still have our prototype. We still have our two string method in there. So if I do, con well, you don't have to do console log in here because I'm in the console, but I'll do that anyway. Um, so if I do console log uh, example, actually, no, let's not do this. Let's do type of. That's what it is. So type of example to show that's an object. Example dot two string. 
can see we can run this, and now all of a sudden we've converted it to a string. So every object that exists has that two-string method built into it, um, and all these different other things. So a prototype pollution is I have the ability to poison the prototype with a key value pair that it's not supposed to have. So, and I think this will work in the console. I don't think it will yell at me. So if I do uh, example dot proto dot arson, and uh, that is equal to arson. Oh wait, well, it's got to be a string, right? There you go. I think it'll let me. Yeah, it'll give me away with that. So now, if I just do uh, example again, print that out. Let's open this up and go look at the prototype. Here you can see the prototype has the arson arson key value pair now, and so the object has it as well. So every other object that's instantiated up until this point, if the prototype is polluted, would have that. So I think again the, the browser may have some protections to, to prevent this, so um, it may. Uh, may not have it here, but let's see. It does, we can see it in there. Okay, so we have just manually uh, polluted the prototype there on the client side. So I'm hoping the same thing is happening on the server side. And if so, I can potentially overwrite some string or some functions that, that they're gonna execute within that execution flow after the uh, prototype is polluted with what I want it to do. So if I could come in here, maybe I can impact proto and then we'll target the two string method. And then maybe the two string method now, actually I'll tell you, you know, two strings fine. For server side prototype pollution, there's one that I target every single time. This is the go-to, always start with this, has own property. If you're dealing, if, if we're dealing with objects, if we've got a recursive merge, I promise you, there is a check, some type of a function to go through and check that nothing broke or something. At some point after that, nine times out of 10, they're using the has own property method. Try two string, try any other common JavaScripts or node service side methods, anything else, but always start with has own property. So I would just send this like this. And what I would hope is that it overwrites has own property with just the string arson and I get a 500 error that I didn't get before that says, no, 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 no. I'm trying to run has own property, but that's a string. It's supposed to be a function. I can't run a string, so that doesn't make any sense. That tells me that I polluted the prototype. That tells me that I can now potentially overwrite that and have it do something that it's not supposed to do. Have it make a call, have it access some data that it's not supposed to. So I love this endpoint. I am gonna be doing a lot of testing on this endpoint, especially if I find out that this is a Node Express app there. Ah, okay, I took a lot of energy. Um, I'm going to take a little break, get a little more ice for my coffee, uh, and come back in a bit. Oh, hey, thank you for the follow. Cloud Bite, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Looks like the energy was well worth it. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Like I said, I'm going to put a little pause on here, uh, and then we come back. We will, let's go to the chat. We come back, I'll, uh, I'll keep looking around here. Probably another 30 minutes to an hour, and I think we'll have some good targets for, uh, for us to go and, and try. Uh, oh, yeah, Filet, thank you so much, too. <laughs> oh, now I get to see you right there. Yeah, I try to use my cute dog to cover up my ugly face, but sometimes, unfortunately, you got to look at it sometimes. All right. Thank you all so much for the follows. Thank you all for hanging out. I'll be back in five, 10 minutes. I'm just going to kind of shake it out, get a little more coffee, get some fresh air.
All right, got some fresh coffee. I think um, it's about 3.34 o'clock here. I'll probably do another, um, another 15, 30 minutes, and then I want to hop off for a bit and take advantage of this beautiful weather because it has been snowing and nasty, or actually not snowing, but raining, ice a little bit, and real nasty for the past couple days. And it's finally a beautiful day, and I have to get a run in before the sun goes down. So, um, Steve, I, he asked a question here. Um, how'd you get into bug bounty hunting? Um, so it was about five years ago, I think now, that I started doing bug bounty hunting. Um, in fact, let me see. There was a video by a guy named Stoke. Let's see if we can find it from here. I know he's got, yeah, like a couple of things here, but. Um, so Stokes, he did a video. Gosh, he's got a bunch of stuff on here now. I don't know how long ago it would have been. Um, way back when Bug Crown was first started. I don't even know. I don't remember seeing that. It was one, it was something like that. So anyway, Stoke is, is pretty well known. He's, he's a fantastic uh, pen tester with race conditions, which is a really, really challenging one to do. He's really made a name for some of that. But he's been doing it for a while, and I was just, uh, I was just looking around, sorry, I have to close that. I was just looking around um, for resources, for, for uh, you know, learning more about, I think at that time it was specifically SQL injection. Um, I had something, I, I was a consultant at the time when I was working at Rapid7, and so I had uh, somebody that I was working with that had an issue with uh, my SQL injection. I was helping them try to get sorted out. And um, so I was researching that, and I just came across that video and had no idea what bug bounties were. Never heard of it, been doing, you know, got my start doing pen testing in the military and everything a long time ago. Uh, we didn't do much pen testing, but I got to do more than most people do. Um, anyway, uh, he was just talking, he was talking about Bug Crowd. It was the, like, I think the first year that they had been created and was explaining like, hey, these companies go to Bug Crowd and they say you can, you can hack them. And they, I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Um, you know, certainly never thought in my lifetime that that would be something that you could do, that you can go and hack a company's website just sitting at home doing whatever and not only would you not get you arrested but they'll they'll pay you for it um yeah i just i mean i fell in love with it instantly so um that's the reason that at the time i was more of a uh i was moving into engineering i had started in compliance i said i don't want to do compliance i want to do security engineering uh, i was focusing on vulnerability management a little bit of application security cloud security things like that and when i found out about this I, I fell in love with it and said, I'm going all into application security. And, and that's what I did. And that's what led to, you know, doing some work as a developer and, and uh, you know, um, all that. So, you know, eventually doing the OSWE, uh, everything. So, um, yeah, I just thought it was really cool and kept doing it. Um, and now it's there's so many more opportunities. It's uh, it's great that, that uh, everybody else can, can do it, too. You know, I'm glad to see that it continued to expand. I was worried that it wouldn't catch on. Anyway, hopefully that, uh, that answers your, your question there. Uh, okay, I want to find just a few more things. And I'll go ahead and put all of these endpoints and stuff in the Discord uh, after I, I get off the, the Slack, or I mean after I get off the stream here, so that uh, anybody else who wants to follow along and participate uh, can test as well. Uh, okay, so let's, let's bring this over here and let's see if we can find any other mechanisms. You know, obviously anything with an authentication token. Why do these have different ones? This type of stuff is probably just a tracker. They're probably just recording things. And the most I would do with this is the blind uh, cross-site scripting that I was talking about before. I would ignore most of these. Could be wrong. Um, not this one, but the, this one up here with the metadata and everything. Um, anything under a dot well known, um, there's a typically involved with some type of known authentication process like SAML or something. So I typically, typically peek up when I see that. So maybe this endpoint I'd play with a little bit. I really, uh, this, the, the password mechanism for the store seems like the greatest opportunity to bypass. That's not going to be your 200k bone, but there could be something there. I'm definitely going to be digging into that. I, I want to know if any of this is predictable. Oh, hey, thank you for following. And once again, I'm not even sharing my screen. Good grief. 
There we go. <laughs> we'll get it down here. Oh, awesome. I'm so glad you found it, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of just getting the channel off the ground. Um, I am learning about Twitch. <laughs> I don't know too much about it, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm trying to, to do this as much as possible. Right now, we're looking into the Shopify uh, program, which uh, they just did a thing yesterday where they're paying up to $200,000 uh, for any uh, vulnerability with the CVSS score of 10. So a lot of opportunity to make some money. And uh, so we're just looking for valid targets uh, that we can do. And then I'm gonna post them all in the Discord here and uh, everybody can spend the rest of the day trying to make a little extra money on the weekend. So, and, and learn why you do it. So yeah, thank you for the follow. Thank you for coming. Uh, so yeah, the, the HVAC here, I'm wondering how predictable is this? There's most likely gonna be something that they're signing uh, on the back end here. Um, yeah, I, it's in the chat there earlier. I don't know how long that stays though. I'll just drop this again. Um, I just found out about this, uh, oh, and what were you calling it? The Nightbot thing. So I will have that set up before my next screen or stream, <laughs> I can't even talk, but that's the, the Discord right now. Um, and the Discord is actually for uh, our company. So I'm, I'm an engineering manager at, uh, at, at a company called Flowcast. Uh, and we have a lot of other engineers from the team on there and we do group bug bounty huntings, but it's open to anybody that wants to come. Um, it's just meant to be a place where we can interact with the community and uh, just share resources and, and techniques and things like that. So, uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Jesus, you're the one that's coming here and, and you know, spend your time listening to me talk. I, I appreciate it. That's, I, I never in a million years, I think something like this would exist and people would want to want to listen to what I have to say. So uh, thank you. Um, ooh, redirect URL right here. Um, so open redirects. Uh, very, very easy to test this. I'm not going to do it because again, if it's vulnerable, um, we could have something. Uh, but I would come in here and just, you know, just try bing.com. So, you know, just something that we know it's not supposed to send. So with an open redirect, that's an example of what I call a chaining bug. Uh, typically, programs don't care if you just submit an open redirect, but it can be a way to really expand the impact of other vulnerabilities. So I love to find little things like this, assuming it's vulnerable. We're just going to assume it's vulnerable. I love to find little things like this and just kind of sit. I keep them in my back pocket until uh, I find something else that this can be used to, to combine and, and increase the uh, impact and ultimately increase the bounty. And I, I cannot recommend that enough. One of the biggest mistakes I see newer bug bounty hunters do is when they find a vulnerability, they immediately want to run and submit it because they're afraid that like it's going to be a duplicate or something, or they just want to get a little bit of money. Um, take, take some time, start to get an idea of how the application works, start to get multiple little vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, little things that you think are quirky and, uh, and, and see how you can put them together. Because, and let's take, for example, let's take a cross, I mentioned session writing earlier, it's one of my favorite examples. Let's say, um, let's say you have a client side prototype pollution vulnerability, and then you also have a, uh, a vulnerability that, like a C-surf, a very simple C-surf, but you can't find a way to weaponize it. So you, you submit those two, you might get a hundred bucks for each one. But let's say you take that client side prototype pollution, and then you see that you can use that to expand that into a cross-site scripting. You can pollute a two-string method so that now it acts as an alert. So now you're firing, now you, or now it acts as a fetch API. Now all of a sudden this client-side prototype pollution is turned into a cross-site scripting. You have the ability to force your victim to make requests that they did not intend to make. That is a dramatic increase in impact. And now I've got this little C-surf that I wasn't really thinking much about. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I found Nexus S. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so that's a data URL that you found that there. It's a great technique. Instead of just throwing like alerts everywhere, you use the, the URL, it's the data URL itself. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, so you find the prototype pollution, uh, escalated to a cross-site scripting, then you combine that with a C-surf. Now all of a sudden you've got an admin that's resetting their password. You had two $100 bugs that you were about to submit, but because you sat on them and you found a way to chain them together, now you just changed the admin's password, you just got $10,000, right? So it's, I'm not saying that's gonna happen every time. In fact, it's very rare that it happens, but it does happen. So just, you know, anytime you find things like this, and especially open redirects, C-surf, cross-site scripting, prototype pollution, any client-side vulnerability, especially, uh, the, the client side is a great opportunity to start chaining bugs together because it's all you have it. It's all in the browser. You all you have access to all of that, so you can take your time and do research and see what's available to you and start to get some really really fun stuff. Um, so I love open redirects. 
Uh, anytime you see a parameter that's titled like URL or anything like that, um, typically, if you see that the value is a request and it's coming through uh, the client side, um, that could be interesting. The other thing is this, and it, it, it's not, actually no, we'll go to that in a minute. Let me make sure. Uh, one last thing I want to say about open redirects is if you do farm them, uh, there are different levels of an open redirect. So if we go back from the Bing, this one right here, and I'll just, you can see if we uh, remove the URL encoding. So this is just the URL for the admin page. So the first thing I would check is, does it validate the route? Let's leave everything else here. This would be the lowest impact open redirect. This means that I can change this so it just goes to another endpoint. Not a ton of impact there, but I could potentially find a way to force someone to make a GET request. They don't want. Not a, not a ton of stuff there. No, I can't get out of the, the sandbox here. Uh, the next thing is I would look at getting out of the subdomains. If I can get out of here, uh, does it open redirect to any subdomain so that you know I can do evil store? About that. Now they get redirected to my store. Now I don't I haven't looked too much into this, but it does seem like there's probably some functionality to where I can load my own JavaScript. So I can redirect them to my store. Maybe I'm loading my own JavaScript. Then that's essentially a cross-site scripting anyway. It's still your phishing attack. Same impact as a reflected cross-site scripting. Uh, and then the worst uh, of an open redirect would be the one that I had there originally, bing.com. So this is, it does not care what the endpoint is. It doesn't care what the top level domain is, the subdomain. It doesn't care about any of that. It is just going to send you to whatever value is in here, at which case, you know, I would do evil.com backslash uh, malicious JavaScript uh, to steal stuff. You know, to, you know, you have them make requests back over. You know that if they're being redirected to this, you know that they have a, uh, an active session with the store. So you can basically send them over to your page and then uh, anything has CSERF. Going back to the beginning, we saw that there was a lot of same site lacks. Uh, cookie flags. So if this would work, we can potentially have them to make requests that they wouldn't have been able to make. This, this attack would not work if they had same site strict. So this is all kind of what I'm thinking about as I'm looking at the application because it's always like you tweak one configuration here and it opens up a vulnerability in a completely different place. So that's what I'm mapping in my head. That's what I'm trying to find is where does making a tweak in one area, where does that affect something else? And can we have sort of a domino effect? To break everything there. So I definitely like this open redirect. That one's going in my list. Oh, action again. Oh yeah, a lot of stuff in here. A lot of stuff in here that's interesting to me uh, from a security perspective. So action name. Um, I'm assuming this is, this is going back to some type of different list of available functions and, and accessing them. So I would send this to the intruder and let's clear this out. The intruder just, it's a brute force tool. It allows you to send a bunch of requests and change different payloads. And for this one right here, I would add this as a, as a payload. So we're gonna cycle through this one specifically. Um, do I handle sensitive information during bug bounties? I hope not. <laughs> that's, uh, so yeah, and that's why I'm being really careful while I'm doing this type of stuff here is, um, like, I obviously, I don't want to do anything that's going to uh, expose uh, somebody's sense of information on stream or something. Um, it, it does happen occasionally, especially with, like, database dumps or anything else. Um, the best thing to do is to, I, I guess, craft your attacks in a way so that you know that you're going to exfiltrate the least amount of data. And if you ever see anything like that that you think is customer data, stop, submit it. You know, it just let them know and say, hey, I, I think there's something here. I want to show you what I'm seeing now. And, I, you know, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Do you have any concerns and stuff? They'll let you know. They'll come back and say, oh, we'll set that as needs more information. Say, you're good. Keep testing that. Or they'll come and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do not touch another thing. We'll triage it, et cetera. So um, it happens. Be aware of it. Don't disclose it. Don't disclose it. Um, now, in the United States, now they have recently passed a law, at least for legal uh, liability, to where as long as you're doing your research in good faith, um, you cannot be criminally prosecuted. But that does not protect you from civil liability from these companies. If you do something that the company's legal team deems has lost them money, you can be subject to, uh, you know, uh, to, to be sued. You know, which is why I, I'm very careful here and why I'm only comfortable doing this on stream after years and years of doing this. Um, just be careful. Um, just 
go in with good intentions, talk to the company, send them an email to their security thing, let them know what you're doing, let them know what you're seeing. I promise they're gonna appreciate that, at least in 99% of cases, uh, and, and it'll be okay. Um, just just you know, be respectful to them as, as hopefully they will be respectful to you. Um, but yeah, okay, so the action name here, I'm guessing this is going back through some, some different options. So I'm gonna try and figure out what those are. Um, actually, one thing I'll do first is uh, just go to burp search and I'll just do action name and see if there are other requests that have gone through that have this as well. Um, so that would be right there. So we can see action name index, action name pages. So we do have some other options. So what I would want to know, and I can do, I can do this on stream. There's no no reason or no issue to do this. Um, let's come up and find some payloads, and I just want to do some random words and see if it can find anything. So let's go down to web content. This is Seclist, by the way. Uh, so I got my bug bounty thing there. Seclist discovery web content. If you're not familiar with Seclist, uh, just type in Seclist GitHub. Uh, you'll find it. it's one of the most popular wordless collections that I've ever seen. Uh, I don't think anybody can disagree with me. If, if you know something else, I'd love to, to see it too. But in this web discovery, they have these raft files, which are just a lot of different words, a lot of different possible files, directories. And I will go, let's just do a raft small words. I think the syntax on this lowercase, lowercase there. And then I'm also going to load this up and go to API. And I want to just load actions lowercase as well, uh, because it's aligned with that. Um, try to figure out what the mechanism is doing that you're fuzzing and pick payloads that make sense. Um, that's, it's very easy to see very quickly. So when I'm doing an interview with a new engineer for the AppSec team, let me get this running first, because it'll take a second. Um, when I'm doing an interview with a new uh, potential engineer for the AppSec team, one of the things that I do is I have them bring up uh, our application and just start uh, testing on it and walking through. And I can tell within five minutes if, if, they've, if they're really comfortable or not, um, if they really know what they're doing. Um, you know, just, just little things like that. What word list do they pick? Do they use the developer tools or not? You know, if somebody goes in and just immediately starts going into Burp or anything without looking through the developer tools, uh, that tells me that they probably don't, don't have as much experience with, um, at least with the development side. Um, so yeah, really, really important that the word list that you're picking are relevant to the technology stack, relevant to the mechanism. The more you understand about the application and the more you can specify the word list that are applicable to that use case, the better chance you will have at finding bugs. Um, that's a real paradigm shift for a lot of people when they start to, to see those patterns or when they start to work with the technology. I was hoping that little speech there would take up most of the test, but it did not, but that's okay. Um, so again, I'm running this through. Uh, it's just testing a bunch of different options and seeing what the response comes back. And I'm looking for any variations. I know what wrong looks like. I know what a no looks like. Um, actually, I don't really know. What is a... So we'll sort by the different status code here. And looking for any major variations. Does it give me uh, something besides a 302? Uh, you know, hold on, I want to do this. Let me pause this. I'm going to stop this. And I want to go change the setting. So with 302, if anybody's not familiar, that is a, uh, a redirect response. So the server says, uh, okay, we've done something. We are redirecting you to a different page. And uh, this 302, the browser will accept it and it'll change window.location and it'll move you there. Um, so I'm not really able to see differences because all I'm getting is that 302 error. So they're all gonna be almost the same. So I'm gonna come into the options of the intruder here and I'm gonna tell it to always follow these redirections. Um, and we'll process cookies on the redirections as well. I want this to be as close to the real user experience as it can be. And then I'll come back and rerun my attack again. And now you can see we're getting a lot of 200s. We have a much larger length. We have the count for the, the redirects. Um, always do this when you do an intruder. I, I've been telling Port Swigger, I wish they would just make this default. Um, get all the columns on there. Variations could be a lot of different things. I love that they had added this time of day thing here. We can see variations in the cookies. Um, we're looking for something that we don't expect. We're looking for one of these words to go through and have an impact on the server side to where it's processing an action we didn't know we could do. Uh, so we'll let that run for a bit. Let's just 
try. It's dragging on me a little bit now. We're getting a lot of 200s. We have a pretty, uh, pretty predictable horizon. Oh, what's up, Richie? How's it going? Good to see you again. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for coming back. It's been a little while. Um, so this, uh, this pretty steady rise tells me this is the server. This is not the application code. This is the server that's not very happy with uh, being hammered with requests. And so it's kind of slowing down a little bit. So there's not any major artifacts there. Same over here. So what do we have? Response received and response completed. Um, number of redirects and major variations there. Well, kind of hard to read here, but is there, I don't think we have one that has no, if there's one that has no redirects, that'd be very interesting. No major variations in the length. Okay, anyway, I'm gonna pause this. I'll keep this running later, but this is something that I'm gonna be doing for each of these. So for the action name, I'm looking for, for new ones. But there's, there's attack vectors in all of these different parameters. Um, the handle, I'm probably just going to fuzz with random things. The path, all right, local file inclusion. All right, this one right here, if you're not familiar with percent %2f, that's just a, a slash there. So yeah. go to the decoder. Okay, fine. I, don't, I guess I can't send things to the decoder from the intruder. I did not know that. Um, <laughs> okay, forget it. I'm not going to deal with the coder. I'm going to decode it myself because it's super easy. It's just a path. So this is telling us, yeah, I mean, it must be pulling from something somewhere. We got a, from an attacker perspective, we would hope this is coming from the local uh, server. So, you know, if it's pulling it from here, can we do, uh, I'm not going to run it again, but dot, dot, slash, 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 EC slash. Password. Uh, if anybody's not familiar with the syntax, let me know. This is pretty basic local file inclusion if you do the correct uh, two dots there, otherwise it's not gonna work at all. Um, this is just traversing the path of a Linux machine. Um, we would change this to, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a few different options you can do for Windows. I would imagine this is probably running on Linux though, but this looks like a possible option for local file inclusion. I would definitely run this and do an active scan on it as well. Um, these probably nothing. This is probably all to do with what language is, is being loaded up. Um, but this is another endpoint. Super, super interesting. So we've got we've got a total total of eight endpoints uh, so far that we found on this that I think are gonna be good. Hey, we get up to two hours too, man. And time's actually flying. I'm I'm having fun doing this. Uh, not that I thought I wouldn't, but I thought the two hours would feel longer. Browser details, I don't care. This is just some type of tracking thing. Uh, I definitely want to get into these settings. This is under the store? Yeah, okay, I like this. I like this directory. Let's right click on this and let's do a discover content real quick. Um, so engagement tools, if you have Burt Pro, you can do discover content. This is your uh, Fuff, Durbuster, uh, trying to discover other endpoints, and it will also just naturally crawl each of these. Um, you can go into the config and add some custom files as well, but I think it's fine with that. I really just wanted to kind of go through and request each of those and see what it does. So, um, and it'll, it'll fuzz each of those and start to build out the sitemap here. And then anything that, it's fi anything that finds it's valid, oh, maybe these are not valid. Um, if it finds anything that are valid, it'll It'll, this will pop up as white instead of gray. That means that a request uh, was successful and it got a response. Um, if you see them disappearing on the sitemap like we do here, uh, that means it tried the request and did not get a valid response, which means this could be a mistake in the sitemap, um, which is what it looks like, because it does that immediately. When you do the discover content, the first thing it does is it goes and makes a request to all the stuff that's in there um, and uh, didn't find anything there. So I would probably leave that running for a bit. That's okay. Um, I love, 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 love these endpoints for blind cross-sex scripting. Um, it's also possible, so th this is going somewhere. This is going to some type of a log. 
it's probably going to some type of alarm system for the developers. So they probably have either a Slack channel or whatever they do internally, or maybe it goes to uh, like a internal dashboard that they built out and it's writing all of these here. Maybe it's going to a third party software, I don't know. But this is going somewhere, it's being recorded, it's gonna be looked at. Um, hopefully it's going into, uh, like I said, a channel where, or a, a custom dashboard where it would actually render the JavaScript. But I've seen this so many times to where uh, the developers just think like, oh, nobody's gonna find it. Nobody's gonna do anything with it. And there's a pretty major thing that's, that's missing here, which is, uh, which is the cookies. So if nothing else, like it's not, I don't need to have any authentication or anything. I can just start hammering this endpoint um, and, and pollute that with whatever it would be. I like, I like this one for blind cross-site scripting. Maybe I try some server-side template injections too. Um, BXS, BXSS, I'm not familiar with that. Is that, a, a, is that an abbreviation to an attack? Oh, blindnesses. <laughs> okay, I just haven't heard the abbreviation. Um, in real life, yes. So this one, uh, exactly, yeah. A CSP report, I think this is uh, coming from a library or something. Um, I see this all the time. I see I, this exact endpoint, this exact uh, you know JSON object structure, all that type of stuff. So I have found a blind XSS from a request that looked exactly like this. I think it's coming from like an NPM package or a library. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, exactly like this. That's the reason that it, it uh, really stands out to me, the reason I noticed it immediately. And, um, you know, everybody on the team, they hear me talk about this all the time, but uh, I always talk about what I call pointers. Um, I stole that uh, terminology from uh, somebody on the forums for the OSWE lab, so I don't remember who they were, but whoever came up with that, thank you. Um, but basically a pointer is like, it's something in the application that you have seen associated with a vulnerability in the past. And having a collection of, of pointers, a knowledge of pointers uh, from a lot of experience to me is one of those things that differentiates somebody who's just starting out, somebody that's really, really uh, experienced. Um, somebody that's very, very effective. I don't like the word good, you know, but it's, you know, somebody that can be very effective when they're testing. Um, so, you know, if things like this all the time, I mean, if I've seen, if I've gotten valid reports, obviously I remember it much more. Um, you start to recognize those patterns. This one's a pattern, 100%. Um, and especially if you see no off and it still goes through, that's a big red flag because it's probably something that was just kind of thrown out there. All right, let's see if there's anything else. I've seen so many requests like these in the testing, but never tested. Yeah, it's, uh, hey, I mean, I did the same thing until it was Jay Haddix. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jay Haddix. Let me know if you're not in the chat and I'll bring up uh, some of his good videos and everything. But uh, he talked about, he did a video on that. Um, yeah, is that, yeah, you're, you're familiar with him? Yeah, he's, um, uh, he's great. He's great. And uh, he was the one that, that uh, did a great video on uh, XSS Hunter before and, and blind cross-site scripting. And um, that's when I started doing it. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, next time you see one of these, uh, hammer it with the, um, which I'll, exactly what I would do is I'd right click here. I'd do scan. I would open the scan launcher. Um, we would just do an audit. Uh, scan configuration, select from library. I do never stop doing application layers and I would do extensions only right there. And then before I run it, also probably increase the resource pool here, but um, before I did that, I would have set up my burp bounty so that it's doing all of these uh, blind XSS uh, things. And um, so I, I don't know if you have anything uh, already created for that, but on my GitHub, I do have um, all of my payloads here that are free, it's on the uh, Volan scan templates, you can pull it down, and then pretty easy to, to replace it with your own URL if you wanna repurpose them for yourself. And anybody who's here is new, doesn't know, I have a GitHub, everything that I do, all my bug bounty scripts, my framework that I use, uh, which is up here, all of this is, is free and available. Um, I've got install scripts, so it should make it pretty easy. Um, it's got a separate toolkit collection that goes and does all this scanning, and you can see, uh, so all that, we do like, CVE, so I've got like 1,643. <laughs> it looks like it's mostly SSL certificates, but that's fine. Um, live domain, server IPs, it, it picks up all this stuff. So 
Um, any anything that you see me using on these streams are all free and available. I don't keep anything to myself. Um, so yeah, have fun with it. Uh, it runs yes, it runs locally. Um, specifically, uh, it's designed to run behind network address translation. So the way that I do it doesn't have to be this way, but the way that I do it is I have this uh, installed on uh, my Windows machine, and then I have a virtual machine here. Um, you know, you can see I've got like a whole lab. So if I've got a virtual machine here that runs the toolkit on a Kali Linux instance. So that's what's happening right here. I stopped it because I was concerned that it could impact uh, the, the scan, it's, or I mean the stream. I didn't want it to disrupt anything. Uh, but yeah, so I've got two main modules in here. There's all the different scripts and stuff. This is just something that I've built uh, organically over the years. Um, and it's actually kind of getting to the point that's pretty close to being a functional app. Uh, so I just kind of made an install script, see if anybody wants to use it. But uh, the two main modules that I use uh, are Wildfire and Slow Burn. So Wildfire allows you to allows you to go through. It will scan all of these in one run. So it'll do it'll run my Fire Starter, which will find all the do the, all the subdomain re recon all that type stuff. It will do uh, the the um, spreader, which goes and looks at server IPs open ports, checks to see if they're web directories, does some basic information and stuff there. And then the scan module, uh, which does the CVE testing, which is based on Nuclei and then a couple custom uh, Python scripts that I have as well. And we're working on uh, getting some uh, client side uh, scanning through Playwright, Python Playwright uh, built in that as well. So like much more modern client side stuff, similar to like the, the Dom Clobbler, uh, I can't say that, Dom, Clobberer, I guess is what they call it in, in Burp. Um, but yeah, similar functionality. So yeah, so Kali Machine to VirtualBox. This one runs on Windows. Uh, where's the thing here, just so I can show you. So you'll go to, to my GitHub here. And I, there's my notes, there's the custom scan templates. If you're going for the OSWE, this is one to look at. Um, but here's the framework itself. Whoops, that works still. And the toolkit. You've got to have to have them both. Um, but this one here, just download it and then just get it set up on Windows, install the dependencies. And for the toolkit, it's got an install script, so literally just install that file. So yeah. Again, try to make everything free and available for the community. Um, I hope it helps. Let me know. Let me know if it works. Let me know if you have questions, if you decide to use it. Um, a lot of the uh, the engineers on uh, my team have, have done it. We went. I went through like a whole three hour uh, presentation to show how to get it set up. And I'm probably gonna do the same thing and put it on like a YouTube channel or something so that people will have it. So maybe we'll do a stream like that one day. If people wanna get it set up, just let me know. Anyway, we can uh, end the, the shameless plug for my, my GitHub there. <laughs> so I desperately try to get followers. <laughs> All right. I think that's probably good to get started. Um, let's make sure there's nothing else. Uh, did I get any success? Oh yeah, uh, th this thing, I mean, you know, as you can see, I have a lot of technology behind it. Um, last year it did, I think I got around 42,000 from it, just in passive income, um, just running that. So the, the slow burn module is what I do with that. Um, oh, with the headless templates. Yeah, so the, the main headless template that works for me, where's my thing? So uh, I'm, I'm building a, a Python script to run as part of that, and I don't have that now. But what I do have, I don't want to be here. Um, where am I? Scan templates. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of these. If you come into the headless, so I, I build um, Nuclei templates as well. Happy to go into what Nuclei is if you want, but this is the main uh, thing behind my, my scanner. So I've built a whole collection of client-side prototype pollution scanners for, for this so that anybody else can use it. Um, they have a couple that are built in. I, it just doesn't work, in my opinion, in the way it, it misses a whole bunch of different use cases and it has an incredibly complex uh, webhook to, to do it. And I don't, it, I don't know. I, I ended up using these as a solution because I just couldn't get them to work. And it's just super simple. It just does this really simple uh, code execution. So the other one, they set up this webhook in the back end. It would still load everything up. The only thing that the mine does is it just tries to pollute it and then it just rewrites the body 
uh, with with the value of with the polluted value, and it will fail if the uh, pollution doesn't work. Um, so with these templates specifically, yeah, I probably get a hit on these. Um, I don't know. I mean, one or two a month probably. You get the client side prototype pollution, and then at that point. I try to escalate it to cross-site scripting, and then I try to find the C-surf, and then I go to session writing, make API calls, and then you can have something very somewhere. So um, that's one of my, my uh, more common uh, findings and, and processes that I go through. Um, bug bounty, bug bounty. Uh, no, so yeah, I'm, I'm working as an engineering manager right now, so I'm not doing any pen tests. Um, I just kind of do bug bounties on the side. Um, you know, on and off, and most of it is automation nowadays just because I, I don't have time, uh, unless I'm on a stream to like sit down and, and do a lot. Um, so it's it all goes through automation for the most part. I have a bunch of uh, reports that I've already pre-written out with stuff that I can kind of populate. Eventually I want to build that into the um, into the framework itself, but, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, don't have time to pen this. I, I eventually I'll get back to it. Obviously we do it internally in the company, but uh, yeah, when I was an independent contractor, I used to love doing that. They'd send me like a code base or an app. I get to spend spend a week or two just hammering at it. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of you know. It's a good good day at the office. Okay, let's get that big white screen out of my my head there. I think that's uh, I think that's good. I think I've got a, a good amount of collection or a good amount of targets here. Um, we got several endpoints. This is going to be for what I call, uh, and actually, yeah, before before I start winding up, let me give everybody on here an idea of what I'm doing for the rest of the day. Um, so that if you want to do the exact same thing, you can. So, so um, and let's actually take a step back. So when I do bug bounties, I have four different processes that I go through. Um, the first is what I just talked about with the automation, with the passive income. That's what I call wideband scanning. And that's where you have that slow burn module or stuff. So essentially what that is, is it's hitting, uh, it's finding any program where, let's move this way so you can see a little better. It's finding any program where the entire uh, subdomain, or it has a very, very open scope to where you can find a lot of different subdomains, a lot of different targets. And I will spray those with nuclei and the prototype pollution scanner and all those different things to try to find CVEs or immediate misconfigurations. I find, um, I love looking for anything that has uh, messed up certs. I love messed up certs. Mismatched certs are okay. A lot of times it's just false positive. Expired certs, awesome. Love to go in and do some deeper testing on those. Um, Self-signed certs, that's the best. You find a self-signed cert, go in, hammer that thing. I, you're, you're probably gonna find something. It's got something there. But that's your wideband scanning. You're finding CVEs, you're finding one-offs, you're competing, you're gonna get a lot of duplicates, but it's passive income. The next is uh, what I call narrow band scanning, and that's where we go into an app. So that's, if we're focusing just on our store itself, that's where we do the narrow band testing. That's where we're gonna hammer each other. So that's the next thing that I'm gonna do, and I don't wanna do this on stream yet, but I'm gonna go through any of these that look like they have attack vectors, and I'm gonna start right click, I'm gonna do active scans, and I'm gonna start fuzzing. I'm gonna go to my intruder here, and I'm gonna find these little pieces like we were doing before, and I'm gonna be fuzzing manually through here a bit as well, although this is more for the next step. Um, but I am certainly going to go through and do an active scan on just about everything here. I'm going to see what Burp is picking up. I'll probably run some other tools against it and start to get an idea of its overall security posture. And hopefully that will give me some things to dig into as well. And then the next step from that is what I call creative testing. That's where you're really digging into these individual endpoints and trying to connect multiple different services. And this is the first step of that. So I'm going to copy off each of these URLs and requests, and I'm going to start doing a lot of very granular manual testing. I need to understand what these endpoints do because I've gone through and I've, you know, from seeing these, I'm saying, okay, these are these are valuable. There's something here that I think I can get to, to chain or, or, or find some data, do something that I want to do. There's a lot of functionality. Um, so I'm going to be digging into these. I'm going to be doing that much more targeting tested than I mentioned. So scanning insertion points is part of this. Um, using Intruder, trying to, to find uh, a much more, uh, like crafting a payload as opposed to just fuzzing and finding something. Uh, and then the fourth one is um, white box testing, which is not going to be applicable here. Actually, oh no, it is. I bet you anything. Yeah, they have a thing, don't they? Huh? We can do white box testing too. 
At least, I mean, they've got a bunch of their code on there as well. So this is phenomenal. Um, so we've, you know, I'm going to start looking through here. And 900 repo, <laughs> so you'll be digging through a lot. But um, I'm going to be making a little bit of sense of this too. And if I can get the code to be able to, to correlate the testing that I'm doing from a black box perspective, which means I'm, I'm from the client side as opposed to having the code, that's phenomenal. I can start, you know, kind of using them back and forth uh, and hopefully finding a, a vulnerability there. <sighs> okay, I just threw a bunch of information and everybody's on here. Um, like I said, I'm going to post the, the URLs in the Discord server for anybody that wants to, wants to come and hang out. Um, I'll be on and off for the rest of the day doing testing, might do another stream later, but before I go, um, oh, can you show the Discord server? Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, let me get you on Twitter too. Um, I, I, I have a Twitter account that I just created. I never had one before, uh, just because I never had anything to say, so I never thought I had anything to tweet, but um, I, I need to get on there and start using that too. And yes, let me get you the Discord server, anybody else that wants it as well. So anybody else who wants to, to come in and grab it, what you stretching over there for? Let me come get the puppy while I get wrapped up here because I think he's, oh, you so stretchy. Oh, boy. Okay. There you go. Ah. So, yeah, any other, uh, any other questions about the methodology, what we looked at, anything that anybody wants to talk about or wants me to elaborate on, dig into, uh, before I at least call it a day on this stream here? I know there's always a delay in the chat. That's something I've got to get used to. It's like, I'm used to asking a question on Zoom meetings. You get immediate feedback. I know i got to just wait a little while, make sure uh, nobody wants to chat anything. Anybody says expired? I just created it. That's the same one. Let's generate a new link. Hold on. Ah. Still giving me the same link. I mean, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, it's the exact same thing. And it's telling you it's uh, it's telling you that link is um expired. You know, when I click on a mod, I think it, it works there. But I'll tell you what, if nothing else, um, there you go. First of all, let's get a plug for your Twitter right there. Okay, so everybody go go follow uh, this profile here. And uh, I will, um, I'll, I'll send you a message over here. Um, let me know if, if there's any issues. But we can we can chat on there and make sure you get on the server. Um, and that goes for anybody else. My, mine is, uh, I think I just called it Arson. I've literally not done anything with it. No, that's not me. Oh, no, it's Arson Lion, wasn't it? Just a... Yeah, somebody stole or something. There we go. That's me. Um, so yeah, uh, I have 31 people follow me. <laughs> I have done, I've never done a tweet. Um, oh no, I'm following three people were following me. Is that right? I don't know how Twitter works. I'm old. Okay, anyway, uh, if it doesn't work, let me know. Um, anybody else have any other questions, anything you want to talk about? It is way too late for me to be drinking this much coffee. All right. Um, oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'll certainly do the same for you. I promise I'll start tweeting on there, like, you know, blasting out information and stuff too. But, uh, hey, everybody hung out. Thank you so much. Um, I know it's uh, not everybody wants to spend their Saturday afternoon uh, doing this type of stuff. So it certainly means a lot to not only, not only do you want to do that, but you want to hang out with me and, and listen to me uh, talk about it. So, um, it's very cool. Uh, it's very surreal. Surreal, Like I said, I never thought uh, something like this would exist, but um, I'm super glad to, to be able to have the opportunity to kind of give back. Um, so many people, so many incredibly talented, smart people, giving people help me get where I am today. I would never have anywhere near the amount of skills without all of those people along my, my path in my career that uh, spent so much of their time uh, helping me and, and teaching me and guiding me and everything. And so all I, I just want to be able to, to do the same thing and, and kind of get back here now that I feel like I've gotten to the point in my career that I can do that. So um, hopefully that is the experience that you're getting here. It's certainly my goal. 
Um, any recommendations, let me know. As I've said, um, I don't know much about Twitter. I'm still kind of trying to learn this stuff. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, I will adapt things if I need to, um, to, to, you know, like the, the Discord thing, I've got to do it. But yeah, anyway, thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. I might hop in a little later this evening to do a much more chill, maybe some lab recon on some other programs or something. Hopefully this gives you a good starting point. I'll post the URLs in the Discord. Have a great, great weekend. And uh, hopefully I'll see you soon. Yeah, I saw it. It just came in. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, Richie, man, thank you so much for coming. I, I really appreciate it. Very cool to see, uh, you know, people coming back as well and, and stuff. So that tells me that at least you saw something that was valuable. And that's, that's, that's great for me. So um, I really appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Let me know if you need anything. Let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, have a great, great weekend. And I will see everybody soon. Cheers.